Good morning and welcome to the Culture Hour here on Mountain Stream TV. Uh, Thomas Rain Crow. Uh, this morning my guest is John Lane, who has come up to visit us from Spartanburg, South Carolina. Morning, John. It's good to see morning, you. Morning, Thomas. Good yeah. to be here in the woods with you. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing like a cold morning in the woods to get you going. Yeah. So, I think this morning it was right around freezing in my house, so we're going to get warmed up here this morning and, and have some conversation. Um, Let's let's start at the beginning. Um, you and I have been friends for a long time. We had a weird. Um, one of my favorite stories to tell when we're together is how we met. We um we had a weird sort of um, chance collision, as they say in the movie business. Um, I was living over near um near Whittier, North Carolina, and I'd, I'd moved up here. I had a fellowship, and I was going to spend a year in the mountains. And I moved into this house. I found on um <laughs> in the newspaper, and I rented this house, and it was furnished. And I moved all my stuff into this house and my books and my early computer. It was 1984, 85. And um, um, my landlord had told me, well, my ex-wife might come and get the couch one day. So you might come home and the couch is gone. So one day I came home and there was a note in the middle of the floor. The couch was gone. A note where the couch had been. And it said, we read all the same books. Call me, Thomas Raincrow. <laughs> and I called you and that was the beginning of a 30-year friendship. Because we do read all the same books. Well, we still read all the same books, <laughs> and we're we're here to, we're here this morning to talk about all or some of the books that has come um, out of that connection that you've been writing over the years. And yeah. we're going to get into that a little bit. But tell us a little bit about how you came from Spartanburg um, into the Western North Carolina mountains. I mean, what that transition was like. Well, literally this morning I got on I-26 and I came up to Asheville. <laughs> then I hit 1923-74 and here I am in the woods with you. But figuratively, um, I I grew up in the Piedmont. I'm sort of a poet and a writer who most of my work sort of centers in the Piedmont region, bio region. Um, but because of my love for the mountains, my mother used to bring me up when I was a kid, used to drive up the mountain front and we'd stop and have um, have picnics on the Saluda grade at those picnic tables and, and I would listen to that water down there and I was just fascinated with this running water because in the Piedmont you don't get that so much and I really got interested in the mountains and when I had a chance um, to begin to come to the mountains when I started whitewater kayaking in the 1970s and canoeing, um, I just fell in love with this place and knew that someday I'd have a connection deeper than just a transient connection driving up, driving back. And so when I met you and you had a place um, up here and you'd been developing sort of your 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 connection to, to this region, um, I, I started coming up and seeing this place you owned and we ended up exchanging it. Um, I ended up buying the place and now when I leave here today, I'll run. Over, I'll go over there and spend the night over there at what we call the tower, um, in, in near Cullowee, North Cullowee, and um, and that that place has really become a place that's deepened for me and deepened my understanding and my connection to this landscape. In the early years, though, you were connected strongly with the Manhattan Outdoor Center, yes, right? I mean, yes. Didn't you spend most of your time even working there. Yes, I worked there for 10 years and I was the person at NOC who started the book program in the store. When when I when I arrived there, they, they sold a couple of books that were um, river related, like A River Runs Through It by Norman MacLean. Um, but when I got there and they asked me to become the book buyer, I started just flooding the store with, with any kind of novel, um, poetry, nonfiction that was either outdoor related or river related. So at one point, um, we had 30, 40 titles we were selling out of there that were um, were not guidebooks. And so I saw that as a real chance to to um, deepen people's understanding of rivers, not only as um, roller coaster rides, but as <laughs> things that could um, could teach you about the natural world. Mm -hmm. And you've gotten into the natural world in a big way over the years, and um, we want to talk a little bit about yeah. that maybe in a few minutes. But so you were at NOC. What what was your life, your literary life like before you settled into NOC? I know you did a lot of traveling out on the, to the west and, and things. yeah, but what yeah. Was that well, all? In college, um, I was um, I was a first generation college kid. 
Nobody in my family had ever been to college. My mother, my father, none of my aunts and uncles, my cousins were beginning to go, and I, I began to go. And so when I got to Walford College in Spartanburg, South Carolina, I didn't really have much direction, and I wasn't a very good student. Um, and when I, But when I got there, I, I wandered into a couple of teachers um, who really lit, lit my fuse, and they were all in the humanities, except for one geologist. There was a geologist, and there was an English professor, and a philosophy professor, and a writing teacher. And um, so suddenly I realized, dang, there's, this is something I can do. I can write. I might not be able to study um, the way you have to for, as a biology student and memorize all of this stuff, but I, I seem to be pretty good at writing. So I plunged into it. And um, by the time I was a senior, um, there was a there was a prize on campus, a money prize, a couple hundred bucks, called the Helmus Poetry Prize. And by the time I was a senior, and everybody wanted it in the English department, all the students. But by the time I was a senior, I'd won it three years in a row. <laughs> so I I, um, I I sort of um, saw myself as a poet, and so sort of left college not knowing what I was going to do. So I wasn't going to make a living as a poet. I knew that, but. But I, um, I got, um, somehow I got out to the West Coast. I got out to Port Townsend, Washington. I just decided to go out there. Had a little bit of money saved. Took a flight, hitchhiked, ended up in Port Townsend at the Port Townsend Writers Conference and met Sam Hamill and Tree Swenson at Copper Canyon Press. And they liked my work. Um, and they said, stay around. We've got some money. We'll give you a stipend and you can learn to letterpress print. We'll print your first chapbook. So I did that and um, stayed out there a year. And then during that year, um, I, I got a call from um, a mentor of mine, Donald Hall, poet up in New England. And he said, Bennington College is, uh, is our University of Virginia has this new fellowship program called the Hoynes Fellows, and you ought to apply. And so I applied to that, ended up in Virginia for a year and a half, two years. And, this led to that, and that led to this. And <laughs> by 1988, I was teaching at Walford. Right, yeah. right. right. And you've been there ever since. And you were you started out in the English department. Yeah, right? 30 years in the in 20 years in the English department, and now I've been 10 years in the environmental studies department, right. which I created. And that's what I was going to yeah. say. I think you were the one that really initiated that yes. whole program. Yes. And, and uh, it's it's going you know full tailed boogie now. I mean, yes. it's very very active and very progressive. And, isn't Walford going very um, green and very environmentally? Yeah, we've gotten a couple of grants, and this committee that um, that I was the chair of that formed the Environmental Studies um, program 10 years ago now has sort of moved into trying to figure out how not only we can have an academic program, but how we can green up the college. Mm -hmm. um, we, we're doing a lot of energy-saving initiatives and um, um, all sorts of stuff. Right. I was just down at Furman University a couple of weeks ago, and they're doing the same thing with their campus. And they're, they're the leaders. <laughs> well, they they are remarkable. Yeah, what they've done. David yeah. Shy down there got that thing whole thing started, and they've got the Shy Sustainability Center and yeah. all that. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. So, all that is all for the good. So you started out writing poetry mainly, yeah. and you did that for a number of years, but then you transitioned into prose. What was that like? What, how did that happen? Well, in college and after college, I saw myself completely as a poet. It never occurred to me to, um, to write prose. And then um, I've thought about this a lot recently because I published a novel last year, and I, and, I, and I started thinking about, so when did I start beginning to think of myself as a fiction writer? And, I actually started writing fiction first. I started uh, I started this crazy apocalyptic novel that my wife, <laughs> Betsy, um, sort of um, um, thinks I should go back to of these um, these 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 greens who who take over a sea island development and deconstruct it, completely destroy the sea, and try and bring it back to um, to, to to a natural state, more natural state. And it was it was called the Sawgrass Rebellion. I'd be, been reading a lot of Edward Abbey at that point. You know, so <laughs> instead of the Monkey Wrench Gang, it was the Sawgrass Rebellion, and I had all these characters, and and I wrote about a hundred pages. And when I look at it now, I've still got the manuscript, and um, 
I was typing rather than, I mean, and, and you know, writing and typing, and it was this little thin onion skin paper, and I'm looking at this thing going, that's a long time ago. And, but that would have been about 1983, 82, and I was writing poetry, but I was beginning to think of myself as a storyteller, maybe. And then a friend of mine down in um, Columbia, South Carolina, um, called me and said that she needed writers for this magazine called The State Magazine. It was a Sunday supplement for the largest newspaper in South Carolina. And this is the kicker. She had money to pay for the article. And as a poet, I'd made about $35 at this point, <laughs> even though I'd published a lot of poems. But, but when she said, you know, I'll pay you 200 bucks an article, and you can write about anything you want, and you can write three a month. Wow. And um, I didn't have much money at that point, and I said, dang, I can write about anything I want. She said, yeah. So that's where I started beginning to explore what people now call the personal essay or creative nonfiction. Some of those early articles, um, I wrote a piece about the Blue Ridge Parkway where I rode the entire parkway and wrote about it. You did that this summer. Yeah. All right. And um, I wrote a piece about driving a highway from Spartanburg to the beach, Highway 9. I called it Cruising Number 9. Um, I wrote a piece about why I loved whitewater kayaking um, called um, In Praise of Falling Water. Mm -hmm. I wrote a piece about um, layups, why I did not like the dunk. Because when, I was, when I, I was a basketball player, and when I was in high school and, and college, it was illegal to dunk a basketball. I don't know if you remember that period. No, I don't. No. There was a period when there were no dunks, really? except in the pros. Well, the pros. Yeah. yeah. So, so, um, so then the dunk came back into college basketball, and now it's one of the most exciting things. But I wrote this this piece about sort of why layups were more to me were more graceful than dunks, and that somebody like David Thompson, a great player at NC State who could never dunk in college, why he had to learn creative ways to lay the ball in because he just couldn't go Wha -woo! <laughs> and, and dunk it. So she, she gave me carte blanche and I could write anything I wanted and I probably wrote 10 or 15, 20 pieces for her and it also led to writing for people like the Communicate, um, an Episcopal newsletter that paid, that I wrote a piece about you for when we went looking for um, a, a medicine wheel up near Fort um, Fort what was it called up there? Your friend who had the old Ford. Old Ford. Yeah, we. I wrote a piece about you for that. This was 30 <laughs> years ago, and or 35 years ago. But I discovered that I could keep writing poetry, and I could also write prose. More people would read it, and you've discovered the same thing. Right. More people would read it, and it also get a paycheck. Right. And it wasn't big paycheck. It's gotten bigger as the years. Occasionally, I've gotten some big ones. Yeah. But um. But mostly it was two, three hundred dollars. But I got to write whatever I wanted. Right, and down the road a little oh, ways, yeah, uh, you 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 hooked up with another newspaper, yeah, uh, down in Spartanburg, uh, or was this the one in Greenville? It was. It, it came out of Greenville, but yeah. they had a, a paper edition that came out in Anderson, Greenville, and Spartanburg. And sometimes <laughs> these pieces would appear in all three of those papers in one week, and it'd be sixty thousand people reading the paper. Right. And sometimes it would just be Spartanburg. Right, and then you had a column called the Kudzu Tra Telegraph, and this yeah. is a collection of, of some of the essays um, that John wrote uh, as part of that column for several years. Yeah, this is the Kudzu Telegraph. Um, I I got a call from an editor. She needed a op-ed piece on a weekly basis. Offered me um, offered me money to do it, and um, I ended up writing five years, two hundred and fifty pieces, and um. The crazy thing was that I knew that the copy was due Monday morning at 8 o'clock, 8 a.m., and I never started in 250 columns. I never started a column until Monday morning. Oh, really? And I never missed a deadline. <laughs> oh, my God. I would just kind of stew all week about what I was going to write about, and then I trusted that I could get up at 5 a.m., that by the time my wife got up to proof it at 7.30, I'd have a column. It's only 600 words, but right. still. But um, I, I hit my deadline every time. And then the newspaper went through some changes. Um, they asked me to write it for free, and I said no, and that's when this came to an end. But Hub City Press in Spartanburg, my um, press my, my wife and I started, um, did a 
a selection of those 250. They did three of 30 of the 250. So you've had a long history, though, now <laughs> since since those days of uh, writing novels and and nonfiction books, and they're um, different different perspectives, different subjects, but. Um, one of the ones that um, a lot of people in this in this region will know about is the, your book you wrote on Chattooga, on the Chattooga River. Yeah, yeah that's my best-selling book. Is it? Yeah, I just look, I got my royalty statement from the University of Georgia Press about a month or two ago, and, um, and I was fascinated by how well that book's done compared to, you know, the other books have all done okay, but the Chattooga book really connected with this region. Right. It's interesting for a lot of writers, you could ask almost any writer that, that we would know, uh, and they would probably point to one book that really either launched their careers or really uh, was the staple in their yeah. in their their list. And uh, I've got one, the one that you encouraged me to write, Field. Zorro's Field. Without Zorro's Field, I'd still be working at Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> well, Zorro's Field is a classic, and all these books of mine sitting on the table they're, they're going to be around occasionally, but people are going to be reading Zorro's Field 50, 100 years from now. Well, it's a great book. We won't be around to see that. <laughs> that's true or not. But but the Chattooga book, you know, it, it's about whitewater kayaking on the Chattooga, but it's also connected to the movie, yeah. um, Deliverance. And tell us a little bit about how that worked. Well, so when I was beginning to learn, that was my first um, full-length narrative where I wrote a whole book about one thing rather than a book of essays or something. And I realized that the story of me paddling down the Whitewater River wasn't enough. That, that wasn't enough to make a book out of. So I needed a second narrative, and I knew exactly from the beginning what that narrative was. Mm -hmm. Nobody at that point had told the whole story of James Dickey's involvement with that river. And I loved James Dickey as a poet, and I loved teaching deliverance, the novel, and I loved watching the film, which was very different. So already right there I had poetry, a novel, and a film, and a river. And then I had my own story. And so I, 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 and I also knew that there were only two types of river books. There was you go down the river or you go up the river. <laughs> down the river would be Huckleberry Finn. Up the river would be Art, Art of Darkness. And I, I did not want to go up the river because I'm a kayaker. I like the easy way down. So I knew that I was going to have to start up in the headwaters of the river around Cashiers um, and work my way down chapter by chapter until I got to the big molasses impoundment, as um, some people call the lake at the end, mm -hmm. Lake Tugaloo. And I would work it my way down chapter by chapter. And in that chapter, there would be a story about me doing either walking or paddling that section of the river. And then I would lay on top of that all the research I could do about the history of the river, the Native American presence. Each section would have its own connection, and also deliverance. Right. All the all the deliverance. And you material. actually interviewed some of the <laughs> uh, the the, yeah. the filmmakers and the the actors. Yeah. And I think I think you even interviewed the banjo boy. I got the banjo boy, <laughs> and I was not going to do that. Um, Billy Redden is his name. Yeah. Um, and I was not going to do that. I'm not a journalist. I, I, a lot of journalistic technique comes into my work, but I'm a poet. And so when I was working on this book, um, I did not have any plans to track down Billy Redden and interview him. Um, but my wife is a journalist, <laughs> and she read the first draft of the book, and she said, there's a really big missing piece of this book. <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> oh, I don't want to do this. What? And she said, you got to go over there, and you got to do some reporting. you got to find Billy Redden and track him down and talk to him. And so I finally said, she's right. And I went over there, called, called, got in touch with him. I found out he was working at the Huddle House in um, Clayton. Mm -hmm. And I called him up. He was very nice, very open to coming over, although he said that I was going to have to work around his schedule, because he was a dishwasher, and he, he worked hard, and, mm -hmm. and so I was going to go ahead and get over there, I was going to have to wait for him, and I got there that morning to interview him, and he was, they had been a big morning, he was busy, he was running behind, and um, I told the waitress, um, I'm here to interview Billy Redden, and um, she went back there, and um, 
told him, and he was still had a lot of stuff, and said, tell him it'll be 15 minutes. And I also wouldn't drink coffee and wait. But she said something, the waitress said something um, that I'll never forget, and it really put me in my place in a good way. She said, well, if he's here at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning, he must not need to work so he can wait. And, I mean, it showed my, me my privilege, and it sort of set me, and I wrote all that into the chapter. I mean, that whole idea of, here was this guy that had basically been exploited by Hollywood. Um, they'd made a lot of money. He'd been paid, I think I say in the book, but I think he'd been paid 500 bucks. And he is the, the icon of that movie. I mean, he should have made a million dollars in that movie. Um, and actually, he did. Later, he was in another movie called Big Fish. <laughs> and they paid him a lot more to get him to come back and do the second movie, which is fair, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. But um, but um, but that was a really powerful moment for me, realizing that when you go into other people's worlds, you know, you you do carry with you who you are. And I was a college professor, and I could take off a day and go over there to do an interview. Right, right. Yeah. So that's all very exciting. And the book, the book is all very exciting, and. Uh, haven't read it out there in Mountain Stream TV land. Easy to get. Easy to find. <laughs> right, right. That's, that's one you should go out and, and, and get a hold of. But since then, there's been a lot. I mean, talking about traveling downriver or upriver, you did a whole Mountain to the Sea trail yes. and wrote a book about it. Yeah, that was a good book for me. Um, I, I found a book um, at a book fair um, called Paddle to the Sea, and it was a children's book written in the 40s. And it was about a, it was actually about a little Native American child who carves a little canoe and throws the canoe in the Great Lakes, and the, great, the canoe makes its way through all the Great Lakes, all the way to the ocean. And uh, the canoe was named Paddle to the Sea. And when I read this children's book, I went, I can get in my backyard and paddle 300, 300 miles, and I'll be in the ocean. And so I started at that point thinking about this narrative and how could I do the same thing sort of I did with the Chatuga book and much longer narrative and put that together and it was super super fun and, it, and successful when it came out and I've gotten a lot of actually one of the coolest things that I didn't expect to come of this is I've had five or six people repeat my trip since I wrote the book including a young woman in, in high school who, who did the entire trip between her junior and senior year by doing single section at a time, but she, she read my book and she said, I want to do that, so she and her father and friends would just do a section each time, and they did it, they completed it this year. I had students at Walford for um, one of their capstone projects do the trip, and so that's one of the things that's most gratifying to me, to think that there are people out there paddling these 11 days to the ocean mm -hmm. just because they read my book. Right, right, yeah. well that's, that's special when that happens, it's nice to get that kind of feedback. Happen all the time, so it's, it's a nice when it does. You sort of, in a sense, did that when you read the row, and and, yeah. and then you ended up yeah. Yeah. in in the cabin in the mountains. I did. I did. In, in your in your life. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of what what uh, inspired me to stay in the cabin and not go back to California. Instead, hunker down and try to do something yeah. similar to what Thoreau had done at Walden. Yeah. But, but you've also written a book called Circling Home, and this is <laughs> this is a again a very different kind of book it it deals with the the natural world but it, it it gets more into the culture and into um community and and uh that sort of thing uh just tell us a little bit about uh, how you came into the with the idea of doing this book and how it flushed out for you well this um this is what i think of as my as my um home home trilogy i've got three books from georgia circling home my Paddle of the Sea and Coyote Settles the South that all start within a hundred yards of each other. And um, this book was the first one, Circling Home, and what happened is I had an interim off, a January off at Walford, did not have a project, was in between projects, and I was sitting at home one day and I, we just moved into a new house on the east side of Spartanburg, and I had a topo map of the neighborhood, and our house site was on the map, I, I'd drawn it there. I took a plate, a saucer, and I placed it on the map, and I moved it around until the saucer was right in the middle of, of the house, um, where the house was on the map. 
And then I took a ma magic marker and done, did what you should never do, which is destroy a perfectly good topo map by marking on it. But I marked all the way around the circle, and then I picked up the saucer and I went, ah, oh, I can write an entire book about what's in this circle. And, um, and I measured it, and I, I discovered that it was a mile in all directions out from this saucer. So I had a mile to work with around the house, and I decided I was going to explore the circle and learn everything about, I could about it for one year. And so I, I did that, and um, this book came out of it. Right. It's a great book, Circling Home, because it's really about being in place. And, um, it's bioregional yes. in a lot of ways because you're really focusing on the area right around you. Because the creek runs right behind, obviously, from my paddle of the sea, the creek runs right behind their house. So I had, a, had all kinds of landscapes to work with. Right, and you, it was yeah. kind of like getting to know your, your own environment uh, yes. in a very, very intimate way. I mean, you were discovering you know, microbiology and, yeah. you know, astrobiology. And, yeah. I mean from the treetop, bedrock to treetop, basically, and then outward. And I tried to go as deep into history as I could. I, I, I looked into a, um, a friend of mine had found about a seven or 8,000 year old um, cache of paleo points only a quarter of a mile from my house back in the 1960s, and he still had them, and I was able to go to that spot and realize that there had been these paleo Indians moving through this landscape four, five, 6,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. What what have Native Americans been uh, for you as an influence? I know you have uh, your heritage uh, includes some Native Americans and, and in your family line, and so how has that influenced your your interests and your 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 take on the environment and all that? I think it's always been there for me, and it's always deepened my understanding of landscapes, and that it gives me uh, with geology and with those. Um, genetic feelings of genetic connections um, it gives me sort of a depth a, a deep time like the, when I discovered that this this paleo um, site was in the circle it was super exciting to me because most people in my in my place that read this book would have thought that deep Native American time would have meant Cherokee mm -hmm. um, and in in, my, in, the, in in every area in the southeast, Paleo Indians were, were everywhere, and and I mean the the, the depth, the ten, twelve thousand year depth of time for native peoples, and native peoples would even argue further back than that, um, but that we know about through archaeology, um, white what white people at least agree upon is that that ten thousand, twelve thousand year old depth. But I would say that in every way, through myth, through storytelling, through poetry, I've read a lot of Native American poetry. Um, it's always deepened my understanding of my relationship to the land. Right, right. Yeah. It's, it's very clear, it's very organic for for you and in terms of how I see you. Yes. It's been very natural. It's not something you you went and got an MFA degree in, yeah. <laughs> no. Native American Studies or something. And the, yeah. G the DNA is actually a little um, fuzzy with me. I've done 23 and Me and all that, and mm -hmm. it, it, could, it could also be African American. I mean, it's, yeah. it's there, too. That's there in my DNA as well, back at that sort of third, fourth um, ancestor level. Um, right. And I know that I had an ancestor over in Rutherford, Rutherfordton County um, who was a, a hammer man, a slave on an ironworks. His, um, we know his name. We know the direct line. But we, but there's, a, there's sort of a weird sort of tri-racial thing going on. Yeah. Yeah, it's that, fun because for so long people would hide their 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 African American and their Native American ancestry, you know, and were ashamed of it. Yeah. But but now I think, you know, it's something to be proud of and also to um, to gain gain from. I mean, you know, yeah. uh, people are making a fortune out of it. Twenty three Me is one of those yeah. popular things yeah. going right now. Yeah, because diversity is the big yeah. one of the big buzzwords, and you know if you're if you can trace your own history back to different ethnic groups, yeah. I mean you've got diversity going yeah. on, oh, and, yeah. and that's positive. Yeah. It's not something to be ashamed of. Yeah. So, well, tell tell us a little bit. We'll, we'll just kind of go through your um, 
You're yeah. heading toward the future. I mean, toward the present. Here. Hopefully, the future too. <laughs> yeah, right. We'll, we'll eventually get there this morning. I hope. But uh, no, but we're going through your titles list a little bit here this morning, and and we've got another one here that's very recent. It's called Coyote Settles the South. And I can remember when you told me you were working on this book, and I thought, Coyotes in the South. Now, what? How is this going to work out? But you can tell us. Yeah. So I was um, doing a reading down in Aiken, South Carolina. Um, it's about three years ago now, three or four years ago, and I, I had a call from a former student of mine who's a biologist, wildlife biologist named John Kilgo. Um, his father was James Kilgo, one of the most famous nature writers in the South, and he was a great friend of ours. Mm -hmm. And um, so John Kilgo calls and says, I really want to have breakfast with you and bring you up to speed on all this great research I've been doing that you probably don't know about. Oh, well, that's interesting. I get a good free breakfast out of this, <laughs> not knowing it was going to end up taking two years of my life. Um, but I went to breakfast with him, and John said, um, nobody in the South, really, except for biologists and hunters, realize that coyotes are everywhere and that they will soon be a huge issue in the South, the whole South. And I said, well, you're right. I, I hadn't really thought about them that much, and I'm out in the wild all the time, and I did hardly everything about coyotes. Mm -hmm. And I knew they were coming, I knew they were around a little bit, but I didn't think about them as, as omnipresent. So um, I went back after he planted the seed, and I, and I looked at his research, and he'd done a fascinating research on, on coyotes down on, down on the Savannah Riverside, and deer, coyotes and deer, that's what he was interested in. And um, so right after that, I heard in my own backyard, coyotes, for the first time. And that's the beginning of this book. I hear the coyotes and I decide I'm going to travel all over the South and talk to everybody I can from coyote haters to coyote huggers. And I'm going to try to get a whole picture of this new species coming into this region and what it means for the region, what it means for the coyote, um, I'm, gonna, I'm also going to do what I always do, which is find all the literature I can that's talked about coyotes in the South, and I'm going to layer that in there, mm -hmm. and I'm going to just have a great time traveling around. And I did that for an entire year. Um, West Virginia, um, Alabama, North Carolina, South Carolina. I didn't go, those are the four states I actually write in chapters about. Right, right. Well, that's fascinating. Yeah. You know, and it's a great cover picture, too. I like that. Yeah, me cover. too. It was just Noble this, coyote looking over right, the city. Right, right. You, you, got, you got this, you know, a lot of people speak disparagingly about the coyotes, but this, this cover makes him look like uh, the main man. Yeah, and I love to say this. I say speak disparagingly all you want, but there are three theses in my book. They're here, they're not going away, and we have to forge our own relationship with them in space and time. And if we want to hate them and kill them and act like they're, they're, they're vermin, mm -hmm. that's our own thing. That's our relationship with them. And we have to individually live with that. But we also can find other ways to, um, right. to live alongside them. Right. And yeah. it's not only the coyotes. Now we've got bear and the deer coming back. and uh, Panthers. Uh, panthers. <laughs> I've got, I had a panther in my garden last year. Yeah. Um, uh, so they're they're alive and well, and we're going to have to learn to live yeah. with them. And I, in, my, in my book, I make a joke. Um, um, who knows? We even get pythons up in South Carolina. <laughs> well, they're moving I'm, up little by little from the Everglades. Well, I hope I'm not around <laughs> when that happens. <laughs> but you never know. You never know. You never know. So we've, we've talked a lot about, you know, more of your environmental interest in, in some yeah. of the books that have come out of that. and that led to, or were a part of your, your teaching uh, career there at Walford in the Environmental Studies program. But um, you've written recently, also written a novel, and yes. it's called Fate Moreland's Widow. Yes. Uh, it is a, kind of an Appalachian the Wire, for lack of a better um, uh, moniker, I, I suppose. But yeah. it does fit into that. Uh, yeah. when, I, when I read it, I, I thought immediately of Charles Frazier's Cold Mountain and, and Wayne Caldwell's Catalucci and, and some of um, even David Joy's books that he's mm -hmm. becoming uh, well known for. But I have to say, and I wrote a review of your book, and I have to say that I think of all those Appalachian Noir books that have gotten huge praise and movies have been made on them and everything, 
that your book is the most comprehensive and maybe the best of the lot. Wow. Uh, you know, it's probably I probably shouldn't say that. You know. On, on live TV, <laughs> uh, in, in case uh, Wayne or, or, or anyone, Ron or any of those And guys. all those books are great, you just oh, mentioned. Oh, they yeah, are. Yeah, no, yeah. no, no, they're yeah. all classics. Yeah. They're all classics, yeah. and that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And I think that Faye Moreland's Widow deserves to be in the conversation with those other classic that's books. That's great. Thank because it, it, does, it does something that they don't do. What, it, what you're doing there is you're talking about the mill culture down in South Carolina, over the North Carolina, South Carolina border and the mountain culture and right. how those two cultures right. interacted and or um, exploded in, right. in, in the storyline that, that you've written. So tell me a little well, bit Well, you know, I, I, had, I knew I had this story and some other things came about. You know, I found some stories in, in the Spartanburg area that came together and I, I had this idea for this novel um, um, about a mill owner who, um, who, who is charged with murder and then the guy who works with him is pulled into defending him, and and that's sort of the gist of the novel. But I I remember when I first um, started working on this novel, I, I I was joking with my my friend Ron Rash, and I said, Ron, I'm just so glad that you've decided because he's got this textile background too. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm just so glad you've decided to focus on the mountains because <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you hadn't written a, your your mill novel yet. Right. And he said, Oh, you can go ahead and have that. I'm probably not going to write a mill novel, so. So and he may do it someday, and it'll be a great one if he does. But but um but I but I, I remember going, okay, there is an opening here. There is a space. Um, there have been some good mill novels, but there haven't been a lot of them. Um, and so writing about mill culture in the 1920s and 30s, when it was the most exciting at the time of the Great Strike and um, and and all that, it was wide open, and I had this story. And um, I, then I lugged into this series with um, USC Press with Pat Conroy that had just opened up, and they were looking for novels, and I had a draft. That's how I, how I got into that series and how the book got published, because who knows if it would have come to light if I'd have had to go through an agent and go to New York and all that stuff. That stuff's just so up in the air, it was so hard to make, make it happen. But um, it's been, it's been um, it was great, great to be able to find a story and to get it down in the world like that. Right, and, and you were the perfect person to do that because you come from the mill culture. Your family, your mother worked in the mill. Uh, my Spartan mother Earth. my mother was, not only that, but as a rarity, my mother was pro-union. Mm -hmm. And so she would sit at the table and tell these stories about um, her childhood in the 30s. She was born in 26, and how her grandfather um, was anti-union and her other grandfather was Union, and they would fight, and they lay, you know, the, the anti-Union one would lay in wait for him and all this stuff. And and that that struggle, you know, somebody said once, in fiction only trouble is interesting. And I had this trouble right away, of this tension between Union and anti-Union folks in, in, around me in the world. And, uh, and I came right out of it and heard those stories every Sunday at the dinner table. Right, and that union, the strike, is a big part of your novel. A big, I mean, big part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's that's great. So all of you out there, and <laughs> if you want a novel, <laughs> this is a good one. It's a very good one. So I I encourage you to, to check <laughs> check that out too. So, okay, look, well, let's come full circle back to the poetry. Then. Yeah. So we, you know, we we've heard about where you started from, and and your interest in poetry, and some of the adventures around that, and then you got into the into the fiction writing and the in the prose, but now um, you all this time you've been writing poetry oh, yeah. and you've been publishing poetry yeah. books. So yeah, that's like some poems come out about three years ago. Right. Yeah. So that's not something that you kind of put aside to to write um, prose and maybe make a little more money. It's something you've been doing I, all the time. Since as James Dickey once said, poetry is the center of my creative wheel, mm -hmm. and it's stayed the center of my wheel. It's the axis that. Everything spins around when I'm writing, and and so um, when I um, most recently um, I've moved into this environmental studies program where I where I teach with scientists and social scientists, and I'm with them every day. And back in, when I was in the English department, you know, everybody was an English professor. Everybody sort of looked at literature the same way. And when I walked into a class, I knew exactly what they expected me to do with that class. 
part of the department. And so I had to find a new place for myself when I became an environmental studies professor. And I like to think of this book, Anthropocene Blues, as the first environmental studies book that I've read. <laughs> really? Yeah. It's, really? it's because the narrator is a geologist. Right. Um, there's a narrator that runs all the way through it. There are big issues that I talk about in my classes, such as climate change and species diversity, that run through the book. How does poetry speak to species diversity? Well, the way I decided <laughs> is you just put a lot of dead animals in the book. <laughs> and somebody who's a, 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 a good reader is going to get that. They're going to go, oh my God, there's a poem about a fawn in a hay bale. And, oh my God, there's... There, there's, there, there. I, th I think I counted. There's something like 27 dead species, in this book. <laughs> you know. And and so you got the geologist. You've got the the big questions. You've also got the engagement with some big thinkers in the book. I've got a poem that I wrote about E.O. Wilson right. in this book. Right. And then E.O. Wilson, for those of you who know that name, is. His whole thing is about the species extinction and diversity. So. And, and, and half Earth, yeah, which I think right. is a very powerful right. um, idea, the idea that we should, serve, we should save half the planet for air, all the species that aren't us. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Fabulous book. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so this is an environmental studies book. Okay, so <laughs> all your students start taking notes because we're going to get into it. Here is, here's the cover, uh, Anthropocene Blues. Uh, published by Mercer University Press. They do beautiful books. And um, let's start out with, um, tell us what Anthropocene, where, what that means, where it comes from, what's the well, history of that term? The, 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 the geologists, um, for the last hundred years or so, have divided the history of the Earth into periods. Mm -hmm. And um, the period we're in now, according to most people, is called the Holocene, H-O-L-O-C-E-N-E. Pleistocene with the two million years before that was the Pleistocene, the age of glaciers. Mm -hmm. And um, most geologists feel or felt that we were, were still in the Holocene, this period. Still. But about 15 years ago or so, some people started a asking the question, have we moved out of the Holocene into a new period? And that period is marked by human influence. Uh, have we become such an impact on the planet as a species that this geologic epoch will be marked by us? And they asked the question, when would that have started if, um, if that's true? Would it have started as far back as the beginning of agriculture about 6,000 years ago when terraforming of the earth started with rice production? You can actually see that. that or do we go forward 5,000 years and say, no, it's the Industrial Revolution. The minute steam engines came about and the Industrial Revolution hit, that's the beginning of it. And then other people go even further to 1940 40 or so with the first atomic bomb because the first atomic bomb laid down that layer of um, radioactive material in the sediment that, you'll, that anybody forever will be able to go, I wonder what that is. I wonder what did that. And also plastic and all the other stuff. So they decided to call this period the Anthropocene. And it has become a cudgel that not only scientists, but, but um, artists and activists are using pretty successfully to whop us up the side of the head going, Look what you're doing to the. Look what we're doing to the planet. We've 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 screwed it up so much that we're in a new geologic epoch. Right. And but the official cartog uh, the official um the official geologists who name epochs haven't officially signed off on it. Yet. They might, but so far they haven't. Right. So it's still a little bit. It usually happens in hindsight, doesn't yeah. it? I mean these age uh, definitions and everything. If well, it does, if it does happen though. The Holocene will officially become, by many, many thousands of years, the shortest geologic epoch of all time. Well, you know, the Pleistocene was two and a half million years. The Holocene's right. only been ten to twelve thousand. Right, right. Yeah. Well, let's let's um, go into this book yeah. and have you read a little yeah. bit. And um, like you said, it's 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 written from the perspective of a geologist. Not every poem, but I say yeah. every third poem or so. Yeah. There's really three perspectives in the book. There's the geologist perspective, 
there's whoever wrote this long poem, Erosion, maybe the geologist, maybe the poet, and then there's also poems written from sort of the poet's perspective and my perspective. Right, right. Yeah. It's got some great titles. I mean, the, ge <laughs> the geologist on Oyster Factory Road, the, the geologist suspects God plays dice. Um, the, the, my favorite poem in the book, and I wrote this when, when I wrote my review yeah. of the book, the, the geologist anticipates the end of time. Do you want me to read that? Yeah, I would. I would yeah. All right, so this poem is one of the oldest poems in the book. I wrote this, the, I used to go to Mexico a lot. Mm -hmm. um, went down there five or six times. I've probably spent more time in Mexico than um, any other foreign country, probably four or five months total. And um, I was fascinated with the Mayans. And, um, I even took an interim down there for a month and took students down and we visited Mayan sites you could only reach by river. Mm -hmm. So um, so um, this poem kind of came out of that period and it's a prose poem. Mm -hmm. But I really love the, um, the, the way it deals with time. The geologist anticipates the end of time. The Mayans named it the Long Count and described their days with s snakes, frogs, water lilies, and crocodiles. All the things we've named put in field guides, bled of terror, waiting a slew back of Akamal after a thunderstorm. I think of Black Elk, of Harney Peak in the Dakotas. There's that Native American. Um, centers everywhere and nowhere, how afternoon thunderstorms blow in from the east, crash against sea cliffs, the Mayan coast, pile up, break leave the Yucatan lowlands inches deep in flood. Where there is water, there is magic. Where there is magic, there are always frogs, especially in the tropics. Twenty species call like sharp whistling voices of lost Mayan gods. The distended yellow eyes of the holy tree frog, royal digits, open mouths like burial urns. Waist deep in natural history, the past spins like a great cycle that rolls back, different every time in content but not form, a calendar that spirals instead of flips in four-dimensional space, not flat and disconnected like old maps of the world, month to month, horizon to sharp horizon. There were monsters at the edges in 1492, but 400 years later they are everywhere. And this season, the same as the one called Took, 830 years ago. Trust the scripture of travel, of mystery and diversity. The frog night come back strong on animal voices of a thousand worldly gods. Live with contrast. Go south to learn. Make your way home, changed through sloughs, past the shell blue Caribbean, pale pink temple condominiums and praise the holy sun distended above the gulf. Well, wow, I really love that last stanza. That's really one for the ages, John. I really like that poem. Well, you know, I never made this connection until this very moment, but Tom, Thomas, you pulled from me back in the early 90s a whole book of poems called Against Information oh, because yeah. of your correspondence and I was just talking about these things, guest information and other poems. You published it and it was widely reviewed and widely um, cherished. But this is, poem is a lot like those poems. Well, yeah, it is in, in some it, ways. In its own way. It, yeah. It's not talking about the inter information superhighway, no. but, but it's, it's a similar voice. Yeah. yeah. What do you like about that last stanza? Well, yeah. to me, to me it's, um, it's a spiritual statement. It's a, it's a it's almost prophetic. Uh, it's positive. It's hopeful. It's um, um, it's a it's a big. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, I was thinking. You know, you know, all you hear is negative stuff today. I was driving up and just I just heard this terrible program that I, I listened to and I I appreciated a terrible program about the um, the, the Native American um, protest against the pipeline last summer and it was just all gloom and doom and terrible about climate change and I mean I mean and I, I tend to go there a lot too but I was thinking just then when you said that I said so what if a student asked me so how where do you find hope in these times 
and I read them that, right. it, it does it's, say say something. You find hope in poetry and in the, the arts. I think even in the in, in the, a creative work of art that is um, influenced and inspired by the dark side, the shadow side of of our of our times, can also be. Uh, very hopeful and very positive for people. Yeah. So it, it just it depends on the context. And those two words, this this um this last stanza turns on, um, I say three words, but the two that I was thinking about: mystery and diversity. Mm -hmm. You've already mentioned that diversity is one of our key words today, but I widen in this book the word diversity mm -hmm. to mean not only um, people, diverse people. But frogs, <laughs> I mean, frogs are part of the diversity um, paradigm, mm -hmm. you know, um, and frogs go all through this, this they, they're gods. The frogs in this point are gods. Right, and a lot of times, you know, you'll, you'll be talking about climate change or, or one of these issues that we've been discussing, and people say, well, what can I do? I mean, a good grief, this is so big, I mean, I can't be a big Trust big. the scripture of travel. <laughs> well, you say it here, you yeah. say, you say, you, you, you're giving them an answer. Thomas Berry's good at this. Yeah. You know, he'll, he'll point out the things that yeah. we need to be paying attention to, but then he'll give us some alternatives. Yeah, and, yeah I agree. And what you've <clears throat> done here, you're saying, live with contrast. Go south and learn. Make your way home. Change. <laughs> you were told to do that back about 30 years, 30, oh, 40 years ago. Well, Go home. <laughs> Go home, Thomas Crow. Yeah, yeah, that was out of the mouth of Gary Snyder. Yeah, he told me yeah. to get out of his yard. But, uh, <laughs> no, that's not really what he did. He told me to go back to North Carolina yeah. and, and, and get involved in bioregional. And project. you were changed by that experience yeah. out there in the yeah. same way that I was changed by that time in Mexico. Right. I was down there with alligator I remember researchers. That. I remember that. Um, but, but out of that, they got their data, but I got these points. Right, right. Yeah. So, and interestingly enough, you were talking about the long erosion poem that kind of weaves through this collection. Uh, on the page facing oh, yeah. uh, the one you've just read to us um, is a good erosion poem. Could you read yeah, this is the shortest one. Most yeah. of them are more um, more narrative than this. Um, they're all they all have these couplets that I lifted from um, the poet A. R. Ammons, who wrote a long poem, book length poem, that won the National Book Book Award called. Um, um, garbage, and, and he's sort of the spirit in this, this poem. I originally called this poem not erosion, but compost this. <laughs> but um, um, yeah, so this um, a friend of mine said to me once I'd finished this book. He said, "You still need a poem in there. You need another piece of this erosion. You need to sort of tie this geology and this this geology and this poetry together somehow." And so I came up with this erosion. Is geology a kind of poetry? Is orogeny uplift the syncopation of named eons laid end to end? Were they really clanking toward our future? Is geology the story we should put our hominid minds to? Is the Anthropocene us, or are we all? Is geology poetry? Is poetry geology? Does the numerate have the upper hand, or the numinous? Is that a shock of red cardinal flowers, or is it a hummingbird bustling between? Is it a buried sediment to be assayed for carbon in the present, tested? Are carbon levels to Geiger counter as stock market is to CNBC? Is the latest species cha-cha toward oblivion our unrattled success? Is this age the joke? Our sapien ancestors wouldn't get. I guess we'll find out, <laughs> won't we? <laughs> yes, we will. We will. I really had a good time writing that. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, and that's that's also I quoted also from that in my review yeah. because I thought it was not only appropriate but it was very well done. Um, so I wanted to let everybody know that tonight, uh, actually, John's going to be at City Lights Bookstore in Silva. Uh, reading from the Anthropocene Blues and talking about the book and talking about his life and, uh, of course, signing copies and selling books. But um, we'd like to invite everybody listening here today to come on out. If you're within traveling distance of Silva, uh, make it an evening. Come out. It's at 6.30 at the bookstore. And uh, there's lots of places to go afterwards for beverage and food. So uh, 
don't worry about dinner time. It's available. And uh, <laughs> so come on out and join us tonight. We're going to be videotaping uh, the program. So if you want to be part of that live video uh, recording, you know, come on out and join us. So what are you working on now? I mean, you've well, got Anthropocene Blues, which you're on the road with. But yeah, you got anything I got two. I got two things in the hopper. Um, mm -hmm. I just sent off a, a manuscript to the University of Georgia Press. Um, I followed <clears throat> two um, hawks, red-shouldered hawks, in our neighborhood for a year, and I I kept it a, a diary, a journal. I made a vow to myself. I'm really big on this sort of like circling home or. My paddle of the sea, I come up with this sort of idea and I go, I'm going to do this, see what comes of it. And my vow this time was for one year, every time I heard or saw those birds, I would drop whatever I was doing and follow them hmm. um, and, and, and observe them. And I did that and I kept about, a, I got about a 200 page journal out of it and then I folded some other stuff in and it's, it's called Neighborhood Hawks. Hmm. And um, we'll, we'll know whether that is going to fly in the next few months. And then I've also um, just signed a contract. I'm doing a long bio, bio, biographical essay for a coffee table book that's coming out next year um, from Evening Post Books in Charleston, South Carolina, about a 84-year-old alligator biologist in on the coast of South Carolina. They're going to publish the book of all his photographs, but they want this piece that runs through it. And he has the longest running alligator study in North America. He has studied the same population of alligators for over 40 years. Is he the person you went on all those alligator searches with no, years ago? No, that was Ab Abercrombie. Okay, it was Ab. Yeah, but this, he, through Ab, I met Phil. This guy's name is Phil Wilkinson. Okay. And, um, but he's a character. He's a, just a, Ab's a character too, but, but Phil is really a great character. And I, um, I've made 12 trips down there. And the piece is called, it's got a pun in the title, Field Days. <laughs> it's about Phil Wilkinson, but the name of the piece is Field Days. So days I spent in the field with Phil. Right. Okay. So that's what I'm doing this month, trying to finish that up. Okay. So you've always, you've always had projects. You're not a, huh. someone to let time go by and, and just to, uh, waste, waste your time. You're always interested in something and always got something brewing. And so I'm... Uh, uh, yeah, I think I think we've covered the whole. Oh, that's great. Uh, the whole the whole nine yards of, of um, what we came to talk about here this morning. So, I want to thank you for coming. Thank you, Thomas. And I'm looking forward to this evening. That should be a lot of fun. And, yeah. And uh, a, a major event here for Silva on a cold weekend. So come on out, bundle up, and come on out to City Lights and join us. We're going to have a good time. And until next time. Um, Please join us here in the woods for another uh, adventure on Culture Hour here on Mountain Stream TV. Thank you.